on the screen, uh, two charts for the two portions of the exam. Bottom is the objective, top is the, uh, the essay. The average on the uh, essay was uh, 127, so 85%, so quite good. That essay average is getting higher from the first exam, it was I think in the high 70s, 77 or so, so now it's up to 85. Uh, a couple years ago, statistics students wanted me to include 
standard deviation and median. I don't really know what they mean, but there they are, standard deviation of 25, median 130. Uh, you see the, the distribution. Of, uh, a lot of people did very well. We had eight, uh, no, 10. 10 people basically got 100%, which is quite impressive. And then the objective average, 90%. And uh, a lot of people, 20 people got uh, a 95 or higher on that. So uh, very great on the exam. We did electronically again in your Dropbox and uh, marginal commentaries. Things that are highlighted are the, the good points that you made and then uh, the marginal commentary uh, uh, there as well. Multiple choice. So, we're in the home stretch now. There's seven lectures left. Just seven. Eight class sessions. Including today. The last day of class in 12 is a review day for the last exam, which will cover these seven lectures, dealing with a, a 50 year period here, from the end of World War II up to the, uh, the birth of Wikipedia in 2001 is the last thing that this class ends with, the information revolution. And today's lecture is about the weapon that the Cold, Cold War will be fought with, nuclear weapons, the bomb. When we go back on Wednesday, we'll talk about the, uh, the painful but ultimately very successful process of rebuilding Western Europe with huge amounts of American money, the reconstruction of Europe. But Europe's divided, thus the title of this unit, between East and West. Germany itself is divided into West Germany, a democratic NATO ally, and East Germany, a satellite state of Moscow. So we'll talk about what Winston Churchill called in 1946 the Iron Curtain that separated West from East, from Soviet bloc to um, from American bloc. And then uh, we'll talk about the nuclear brinkmanship, which is the hallmark of the second half of the 20th century. Mutually assured destruction is the doctrine that in the event of a nuclear war between the Soviets and the United States, this, each side had more than enough warheads to completely obliterate all life on Earth. Even in the event of a sneak attack, the person who executed the first strike would uh, be utterly destroyed as well. And so a kind of equilibrium exists in the second half of the 20th century between the USSR and the USA because each has tens of thousands of nuclear warheads that are many times more capable of uh, destroying all life as we know it on Earth. So we'll talk about the, uh, the game of mutually assured destruction in the last lecture for this unit. Then we'll talk about what happens after 1989. In November 1989, the Berlin Wall falls and the communist regimes of Eastern Europe East Germany, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania, and Bulgaria all collapse in a matter of months. And in 1991, the Un Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR, itself collapses. So we have two lectures on the revolutions of 89, the death of the Soviet Union. And then the last lecture in this class is a bookend that recalls back to the very first lecture. We're going to talk about the information revolution computers, and a little thing called internet. We began with uh, Copernicus and Galileo and Isaac Newton, and we're going to end with, uh, with uh, Macintosh and uh, Wikipedia. So things will come full circle uh, and we end in 2001. But first things first, we have to finish that war in the Pacific. We saw before break, how the United States had begun to turn the tide at the Battle of Midway, the Guadalcanal, and began the island hopping campaign in November 43 by taking the island of Tarawa, and slowly but surely began to march across the Western Pacific, retaking the Philippines in early 1945, so that this vast Japanese empire by the beginning of 1945 has shrunk significantly to essentially the home islands and 
a foothold in China. The <coughs> Philippines are retaken, Okinawa is taken, Iwo Jima is taken, and a strategic bombing campaign begins in late 44, early 45 against uh, Japan, much as had been the case against Germany, but the scale is much larger. Instead of B-17s, a new bomber that's twice the size of the B-17, the Boeing B-29 is used. And systematically, Japanese cities are wiped off the map. Japanese cities that are uh, composed of a lot of timber buildings. And so the United States begins to use fire bombs. And one raid in March 1945 on Tokyo, 150,000 people. It's estimated that in just a few months, less than a year, a million Japanese civilians are killed in this strategic bombing campaign. Compare that to Germany's 500,000 over the course of four years. It's an exponentially larger and more deadly campaign. But the Japanese show no signs of surrendering. When Okinawa is taken in the spring and summer of 45, the Japanese fight to the last man. And when Iwo Jima is taken, a tiny volcanic rock that's smaller than the Virginia Tech campus, 10,000 Marines are killed. It's a bloodbath. And so plans are drawn up for an amphibious assault against Japan itself. It's known as Operation Olympic. And we have as a pretty important piece of primary source evidence, the declassified war plan <coughs> that was prepared by the Joint Chiefs of the Pentagon for first President Roosevelt, and then after he dies in April 45 for President Harry S. Truman. It's set to go off on the 1st of November 1945, and the Joint Chiefs declare that we believe the only sure way, and certainly the quickest way, to force the surrender of Japan is to defeat her armies on the main Japanese islands. The scale is staggering. Three million American soldiers are going to be involved in this amphibious invasion when it's all said and done. This is larger than Operation Barbarossa. This is larger than Operation Overlord. This would be the single largest military operation in human history. 12,000 aircraft bombers and fighters, 24 aircraft carriers. Japan had attacked Pearl Harbor with five aircraft carriers, 24 aircraft carriers, 23 battleships, 690 destroyer escorts. This is a fleet larger than the rest of the world's navies combined for this assault. And it's a two-pronged plan. The first prong is to take the southernmost island in the home chain, Kyushu, on November 1st, 1945. 750,000 soldiers will go ashore. 150,000 went ashore on D-Day. 750,000 <coughs> going ashore. And then, six months later, on the 1st of March, 1946, one million soldiers will land on the Tokyo Plain. A pincer movement pioneered by the Germans in Europe in 1939, but on a scale that they could not even conceive of. This plan, this declassified plan, also includes estimates of casualties. And in typical fashion, they are underestimated. The military knew that uh, too much blood would cause the civilian leadership to blink. And so they estimate that in the initial assault on Kyushu, between 25,000 and 46,000 Americans will be killed and 150,000 plus wounded. On the first day of Operation Overlord, there were 10,000 killed and wounded total. This is going to be exponentially more bloody. There's an expectation that the civilian population will engage in suicide attacks, much as they did on Okinawa uh, the summer of the spring before. 
These estimates are undoubtedly rosy. You could probably argue that if this operation had gone forward, it would have been two or three times as worse as these estimates state. Hundreds of thousands of Americans would have been killed. For that perspective, about 350,000 Americans are killed in the entire war. This invasion probably would have cost 500,000 American lives. And on the Japanese side of the equation, millions. Soldiers and civilians alike. And that's because the Japanese armies on the home islands are largely intact. There's 350,000 troops on Kyushu. There's 1.2 million on the main island of Honshu. There are millions of soldiers in the Japanese army that have not yet fought in this war waiting for the American invasion. The military believes that this is the only way forward. But there are a couple of people in the military that know there is an alternative. A secret project has been underway since 1939. And if you haven't read it yet, the Peter Watson chapter, A Light in August, is a really good walkthrough of the Manhattan Project. In 1939, exiles from Nazi Germany, scientists, approached the most prominent of their group, Albert Einstein. <coughs> and implored him to sign a letter urging President Roosevelt to begin a nuclear weapons program because Germany had already started. And this letter in which is written that this new phenomenon would also lead to the construction of extremely powerful bombs of a new type. A single bomb of this type carried by a boat exploded in a port might very well destroy the whole port together with some of the surrounding this letter convinces Roosevelt, impressed by Albert Einstein's signature on it, to begin the Manhattan Project, so named because the first meetings of this top secret group happened in Manhattan, New York City. Eventually, will be transferred out to Los Alamos, New Mexico. This is the most secret project that the United States engages in during the entirety of World War II. It's the most expensive. Trillions of dollars are spent. No one really knows the exact thing. But you can safely assume that in 2012 currency, a couple if not a few trillion dollars are spent on this project. That only a few people know its true extent. Now hundreds of thousands of people across the country are working on small pieces of it. But nobody really knows the whole, except for a group of people that could comfortably fit in a minivan. It is beyond top secret. And by the summer of 1945, after trillions of dollars being spent, a nuclear device is detonated in the New Mexico desert in a place called Trinity. Now, tonight, I'm going to be showing in Holden Auditorium at 7 p.m. a great documentary called Trinity and Beyond about the development and use of nuclear weapons in the second half of the 20th century. Great visuals, great music, narrated by none other than William Shatner. How about that? Uh, and so once it becomes clear in the summer of 45 that this thing is actually going to work, uh, High-level meeting takes place in Washington, D.C., 31st of May, to decide what to do with this new weapon. And we have the declassified minutes from that meeting. It was pointed out that one atomic bomb on an arsenal would not be much different from the effect caused by any Air Force strike of present dimensions. However, Dr. Oppenheimer, the chief scientist on the Manhattan Project, stated that the visual effect of an atomic bombing would be tremendous. It would be accompanied by a brilliant luminosity, <coughs> which would rise to a height of 10,000 or 20,000 feet. The neutron effect of the explosion would be dangerous to light for a radius of at least two-thirds of 
the lion. After much discussion concerning various types of targets and the effects to be produced, the Secretary expressed the conclusion, on which there was general agreement, that we could not give the Japanese any warning, that we could not concentrate on the civilian area, but that we should seek to make a profound psychological impression on as many of the inhabitants as possible. At the suggestion of Dr. Conant, the Secretary agreed that the most desirable target would be a vital war plant employing a large number of workers and closely surrounded by workers' houses. The number of cities that are eligible is diminishing rapidly. The B-29s are destroying city after city after city. And this meeting decides that they want a virgin target. They want a target that's not been bombed yet, so they can accurately assess the power of their employ. And the first city on the list is, of course, the city of Hiroshima. On the 6th of August, 1945, three B-29s appear in the sky over the city. One of them, the Enola Gay, which you can see at the Ufar Hazy Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., is carrying a single bomb. seconds from the time the bomb left the airplane until it exploded. And I think there wasn't a man in the airplane that wasn't either timing it with his watch or counting or doing something. I was sure the bomb was a dud. I was sure it wasn't going to work. For 43 seconds, the time and barometric triggers started the firing mechanism. A uranium bullet fired down a barrel into a uranium tower. Together, they started a nuclear chain reaction. Solid matter began to come apart, releasing untold quantities of energy. in stages. The flash came from a giant fireball 300 meters wide. I was astonished. It was a startling light. Even if you had your back turned to it, you felt the shock go through, right to the center of your brain. At the same time, any area of skin that was exposed became very hot. Heat. Heat. Such burning heat. Temperatures directly below the fireball were 4,000 degrees Celsius. The heat rays left shadows. Ladders, railings, even people left their outlines on stone and metal. Anyone in the open air was either vaporized or turned to carbon in an instant. At the same time, the flash sent up powerful infrared radiation and gamma rays. 
These could penetrate walls and attack the cells in human bodies. They were rotting. It was necrosis. Vacuum were no white blood cells, so the blood had no power to fight against infection, and so suddenly the rotting set in. In the end, the hair would start to fall out. When you put your hand on a patient's head, tufts of hair would come away in your hand. It emerged that those who were worst affected had been close to the hypercenter, or had swallowed radioactive material, like the people who drank the black rain. In hindsight, we realized that it was radiation, but at that time, we didn't know what it was. Radiation sickness has become the single most disturbing legacy of the bomb. American scientists had always known the bomb would produce radiation, but the scale of the after effects came as a shocking surprise.
Here is the pictorial record of the result. At zero point, directly beneath the explosion. The soldier in the scene is pointing at the spot from which all damage to the surrounding area was measured in terms of distance from the center of the blast. Within a mile of zero point, the devastation speaks for itself. But in these very roads, Army cameramen have found and filmed pictorial evidence that tells in twisted steel and stone the effect of death dealing atomic power. For example, this was the site of the main Japanese military headquarters. There were approximately 20,000 Japanese military personnel stationed here. They are among the missing. A lone concrete smokestack indicates where a bustling factory once stood. Here's a building that was actually knocked sideways giving you an idea of the force of the blast. Many of the shattered windows pointed like skeleton fingers the direction of the atomic wind of death. On one side, blown in. On the other, blown out with atomic tornado force. Inside, the flash burns on the chairs give eloquent testimony on the heat of the blast a mile from zero point, which singed the mohair upholstery like a blowtorch. Roads in the area fared better than buildings or bridges. Shortly after the fires died down, traffic was resumed. Today, these highways through the ruins are again in use. Beside our military traffic trudge the survivors of vanished Hiroshima, the first city in history to be atom bombed into oblivion. You have seen the swath of destruction created by atomic power in this tale of two cities. The world's greatest minds in science, statecraft, and military matters are wrestling with the problems created by the atom. On this spot, outlined in stone, is a figure representing the average man, regardless of his race or creed. These atomic footprints on the sands of time can never be erased. They point a path which leads to unparalleled progress or unparalleled destruction. Just as in the darkness of the desert morning, when the atomic age was born, atomic power puts the question squarely to mankind. that had Japan had a week or two or three to digest the effects of Hiroshima, especially when radiation sickness became widespread apparent, that a surrender would have happened. But only 72 hours passed between Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I believe that the reason why it was such a short window is that it was a warning to the Soviets. The relationship between us and Russia had already begun to deteriorate now that Hitler was out of the picture as of April 30, 1945. 
we knew the Russians were working on a nuclear weapon. We also knew by our spy networks that they really weren't that close. And I think it was meant to intimidate our burgeoning enemy that not only do we have multiple ones of these bombs, because some scientists had argued that there was only enough uranium on the Earth for one nuclear weapon. Some scientists also argued that a detonation of a nuclear weapon would ignite the atmosphere and all life on Earth would cease to exist. And so I think the attack on Nagasaki was aimed not so much at the Japanese, but at the Russians. This is a chart of the American nuclear stockpile. And you'll notice that 45, 46, 47, 48, virtually flat, a handful of nuclear weapons, because we have a monopoly. The British helped us to develop the atom bomb, but when it was finished, they thought they were going to get the secrets, and we told them no. And it caused quite a buffle between London and Washington. But in 1949, you'll notice that something changes. A bell curve develops because in 1949, the Russians detonate their first nuclear weapon. Shocking America that had believed wrongly that Russia was backwards and technologically deficient and that they could never come up with a weapon own, well, they did. Now, it is true that they had a very good spy network in the United States that had stolen some very important technical data on the nuclear weapon. But the Soviets are also very good at applied science and uh, probably would have come up with a bomb sooner rather than later, even without espionage in the United States. And so you see, by 1961, there's almost 25,000 nuclear warheads, bombs, in the American arsenal, and an equal number in the Soviet Union. And so what had been a monopoly becomes a standoff between us and them. And a new Bureau of the Government is formed to prepare for a nuclear war, the Civil Defense Bureau. CD, that's their emblem right there. And posters go up, like this one. <clears throat> Join now, the Office of Civilian Defense needs you for decontamination squads. It's a good gig. You can protect yourself from radioactive fallout. Get the facts. And civil defense, its mission was essentially to prepare American civilians for the eventuality of a nuclear war with the Soviet Union was not believed to be a matter of if, but a matter of when. And they produced lots of films to educate the whole spectrum of the American public on the, uh, the dangers and how to protect yourself. So first we're going to watch one from the early 50s, uh, creatively entitled, Survival Under Atomic Attack. Taking shelter may be a race against time. 
even when you have some advance warning. But possibly there may be no sign. An attack could come without warning. The sky would suddenly light up. If the doorway is right at hand, use it. If the nearest shelter is more than a couple of steps away, fall to the ground immediately. Flying glass and debris are immediate danger. So stay where you are until you're sure it's safe to move.
half cartoon, half live action film strip that would have been shown in elementary schools from 1951, the famous or infamous, depending on your point of view, duck and cover. <laughs>
try to fall away from windows or doors with glass in them. Then, if the glass breaks and flies through the air, it won't cut you. You might be eating your lunch when the flash comes. Duck and cover under the table. Then, if the explosion makes anything in the room fall down, it can't fall on you. Getting ready means we will all have to be able to take care of ourselves. The bomb might explode when there are no grown-ups near. Paul and Patty know this, and they are always ready to take care of themselves. Here they are on their way to school on a beautiful spring day, but no matter where they go or what they do, they always try to remember what to do if the atom bomb explodes right then. It's a bomb, duck and cover. Paul and Patty know what to do. Paul covered the back of his head so that he wouldn't be burned, and Patty covered herself with the coat she was carrying. They knew how to duck and cover. They acted right away when the flash <coughs> came. If they had been at this doorway when the bomb flashed, Paul and Patty would have ducked and covered this way, like this girl. Heavy doorways are a good place to duck and cover. She will be safer, too. Here's Tony going to his Cub Scout meeting. Tony knows the bomb can explode any time of the year, day or night. He is ready for it. Duck and cover. Add up, boy, Tony, that flash means act fast. Tony knows that it helps to get to any kind of cover. This wall was close by, so that's where he ducked and covered. Tony knew what to do. Notice how he keeps from moving or from getting up and running? He stays down until he is sure the danger is over. The man helping Tony is a civil defense worker. His job is to help protect us when there is danger of the atomic bomb. We must obey the civil defense worker. The creepy guy in the trench coat hanging out in the park. Oh, it's a simpler time, everybody. A simpler time. It is holidays, vacation time. We must be ready every day, all the time, to do the right thing if the atomic bomb explodes. Duck and cover. This family knows what to do, just as your own family should. They know that even a thin cloth helps protect them. Even a newspaper can save you from a bad burn. But the most important thing of all is to duck and cover yourself, especially where your clothes do not cover you. No matter where we live, in the city or the country, we must be ready all the time for the atomic bomb. Duck and cover. That's the first thing to do, duck and cover. The next important thing to do after that is to stay covered until the danger is over. Yes, we must all get ready now, so we know how to save ourselves if the atomic bomb ever explodes near us. If you do not know just what to do, ask your teacher when this film is over. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? So, those are just two examples of dozens and dozens of films produced by civil defense in the 50s to engage the public. But the reality is that if there actually was a nuclear exchange, everybody would be dead. Because weapons technology had advanced rapidly since World War II. This is Washington, D.C., obviously, if any of you are familiar with it. The red circle is the power of the Hiroshima blast. Approximately 20 kilotons, which equals means 20,000 tons of TNT, of high explosives. By comparison, a B-17 could carry about three tons of high explosives. So this is something like seven or 8,000 B-17s worth high explosives. But that's minuscule compared to what's developed in the 1950s. Bombs like the Green Circle, a megaton, MT equals one million tons of high explosives. Multiple megaton warheads can be put on nuclear missiles in the 1960s. And so all of this preparation would have been for naught. Because one single megaton warhead can obliterate all of Washington, D.C. from National Airport 
all the way up to Rock Creek Park, from the Capitol all the way over to the Pentagon. There'd be nothing left. And that's just one weapon. We're going to talk more about the, the advancements, so to speak, in nuclear weapons when we talk about the doctrine of mutually assured destruction. But first, a, a happier lecture on Wednesday. We will rebuild Europe using hundreds of billions of American dollars. Western Europe will be reborn miraculously in a very short period of time.